Thank you for joining us for the next episode of Margin Notes from the Central Church of Christ in Paducah, Kentucky. As you can see on your screen, this video covers the middle portion of the book of Numbers, Numbers chapters 15 through 21. If this is the first time you've watched, this is obviously not the first video on Numbers. Uh, it's about the fourth or fifth video on this on this uh, book of the Bible, and we have gone through several books of the Bible already. We've gone through Genesis, Exodus. We took a break from the Old Testament, went, jumped into the very short book of Philemon, then we had Leviticus, and now we are in the middle of the book of Numbers. And uh, the last video, we had a lot of notes, uh, a little bit longer video than normal. Uh, maybe this one won't be quite as long. Well, there's several notes to share, but uh, we hope that these, each of these encourages your Bible study. As I always say, you, uh, we encourage you to uh, write these notes down uh, in your own uh, notebook or something or a file on your computer, study them and see if they're worthy of putting in your Bible. Something will help you in your Bible study because we want your notes to be your notes. Uh, these are just some things that I like to share. I've gleaned from my study that I like to share, and maybe they will encourage you as you study God's Word. So let's jump right in this time, Numbers chapter 15. In fact, before Numbers chapter 15, above the chapter as you have a, a section that deals with sacrifices and all these sorts of things why is this placed here after the people you know have started to uh, to wander in the wilderness uh, they're defeated in battle at the end of chapter 14 this is a very long note i know you may want to summarize it or something like that but i have that this chapter is likely placed here in other words after all this travelogue stuff to remind the up, up, upcoming or oncoming generation to obey god you've got that um found several times in this chapter, um, following the events of the previous two chapters where the older generation didn't, where they rebelled, where they were fearful, where they start, wish we'd gone back to Egypt and all of that. And now um, he's telling the, the upcoming generation possibly, don't, don't be like that. As you come along, make sure you are faithful. These notes that are longer, by the way, uh, I'm going to move on, but feel free to pause the video uh, to write these down or take a screenshot or something as we as we move along so the videos aren't just me sitting here waiting for people to write something down or guessing how long it'll take to write something down. But that's what I have before Numbers chapter 15 begins. Numbers chapter 15, verse 13, has a very interesting phrase. Um, the verse says, if I can find the verse, here it is. Every native Israelite shall do these things in this way, in offering a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now, all of these commands are for the wanderings, but also when the people come into the promised land. Uh, this is a section about sacrifices in Numbers chapter 15. But that doesn't say every Israelite. It says every native Israelite, which probably just means full-blooded. But there's also a possibility that it could be a subtle reference to God's faithfulness because a time would come when these people would be the ones who were native to the promised land. It would be Israel. Uh, it, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be called the promised land 300 years later, 400 years later. It would be called Israel because these are the people who were there. Um, now again, it probably simply means full-blooded Israelites, but there, there is a subtle reference there, I believe, to God's faithfulness because many of these commands, yes, they were for that time, but they're also forward-looking uh, through the time when the people would be in uh, the promised land in Israel. And so uh, you, you could have a subtle reference to that here in that little word, every native Israelite in Numbers 15 and verse 13. All right, Numbers 15 and verse 30. You've got some passages here about the difference between uh, unintentionally sinning and intentionally sinning. sinning. Uh, in fact, uh, in verse 27, you have the, ver the phrase, if one person sins unintentionally. But then verse 30 begins the word but. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. With a high hand is a phrase we don't use very much. This is intentional or deliberate sin. Uh, that, that's why that word but begins the verse. Verse 27, if someone sins unintentionally. Verse 30, but if someone sins, if I may paraphrase, deliberately, intentionally. And then likely, that's why verses 32 to 36, where you have someone who breaks the Sabbath by gathering sticks, it's a very brief account. It seems like it just kind of is just kind of stuck in there. It's probably there to illustrate this point. Uh, this person knew the law but didn't follow the law. He was intentionally sinning. He was sinning with a high hand. And so that very brief, and again, so, sort of odd account, um, it probably is there to illustrate someone who would sin with a high hand, who would sin, uh, sin deliberately or, or intentionally uh, instead of just making a mistake, un unintentionally doing something that they hadn't already been taught. But this man was intentionally breaking the Sabbath, and so the punishment is rendered uh, that they stoned him to death down in verse 30, uh, 36. 
Numbers chapter 15, 39, this is not what the, the verse says. This this is just my note uh, all out to the side. And it shall be a, uh, this is where, by the way, God tells them to put tassels on their garments. It shall be a tassel for you to look at it, remember all the commandments of the Lord, to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. One of the commentaries I read by a man named Gordon uh, Wyndham, I believe is how you pronounce his name, his little comment was prevention is better than cure. I thought that was a, a, just a nice way of using that sort of um, common phrase. That's what God was telling them to have these tassels so that when they saw them or maybe when the tassels you know, rubbed up against their legs, like, well, yeah, God's law. better. You know, So prevention is better than cure. Again, that's, that's just a note I have out to the side and, and give credit there to Mr. Wyndham uh, for that little simple thought, uh, but one that uh, is encouraging to me as I read sort of an odd section of Scripture about having tassels in the garments, but very important to the Jewish law in the Old Testament. Before Numbers chapter 16, you got a long section. It starts with Korah's rebellion, and then chapter 17, 18, and 19 deal with specific stuff about priests and things. Uh, but even Korah's rebellion, uh, he wanted to be in charge, uh, and he also was a son of Levi. He was a Levite. And so what I have before Numbers 16, verse 1, is that these chapters, chapters 16 through 19, demonstrate the centrality and the importance of the priesthood. Uh, this is one of those sections of Scripture where that becomes the, the absolute central uh, focus of, you know, for chapters here, Numbers, numbers kind of jumps around sometimes, but not here. You have basically four chapters, I won't say uninterrupted, but virtually uninterrupted, dealing with uh, with rebellion against the priesthood, with the priests themselves, with what they're supposed to be doing, with sacrifices they're supposed to offer, and all those sorts of things uh, that just serve as, as just a, a reminder of just how important that was to the Old Testament uh, way of doing things. And then, of course, in the New Testament, every Christian is a priest, and so this is an interesting section of Scripture to read with that in mind. Uh, how seriously God took the priesthood, and how we should take how seriously we should take uh, our role as uh, His priests today, as Christians. So, in Numbers chapter sixteen and verse one, then Korah the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, and On the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Okay, and you go, well, well yeah, that's why how they rebelled. Well, who were these other men? Well, later on, Numbers 27 and verse 3 seems to indicate that members of other tribes were involved in this revolt. In other words, it wasn't just Levites. Um, it seems it was mostly this family group, some Levites, uh, and maybe maybe the vast majority were, but it wasn't only Levites. And that may be why it just says took men instead of something like took other Levites or took the priest or took some priest or something along those lines. But by generically saying they took men, uh, it seems to indicate, again later in the book seems to indicate, uh, that other tribes, you know, at least some members of other tribes were uh, caught up in this rebellion of, of Korah and uh, Dathan and Abiram in Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 16 and verse 3, this is what they're saying, what, what these rebels are saying. Um, they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? That's the charge. Who, who picked you? Why are you exalting yourselves? My note is that God is the one who, who had exalted Moses and Aaron. I've got three, four chapters, excuse me, from the book of Exodus that talk about that. Exodus 3, Exodus 4, Exodus 28, Exodus 29, and of course you can find many others, especially connect with Moses, but also connect with Aaron, where God specifically put these two in these roles. And so the charge fell flat on its face, if people were honest, uh, because Moses didn't just show up and say, you know, here I am, send me. <laughs> he had to be you know, convinced to do it by God himself. Uh, but then when he did, God is the one who exalted him, and God is the one who chose Aaron to be, uh, to be the high priest and to lead the priest and all of that. So the charge was absolutely false uh, on its face. And uh, just a reminder of some chapters, and again, you can find several others between Exodus 3 and here in Numbers 16, where uh, Moses and Aaron didn't just say, hey, it's us, but God said, or God did something to show it really is Moses, it really is Aaron, who are exalted, who are the leaders of the people. Numbers 16, 13 is a very, in fact, until I was studying through Numbers uh, recently uh, for myself as well as preparing for these, I never had really thought about this. Um, I'm looking at the wrong verse. Um, verse 12, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eli, and they, and they said, 
we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also make for yourself a prince over us? You may have seen this a thousand times. I never thought about it. Um, when we hear the phrase, land flowing with milk and honey, we think of the promised land. That's not what they're saying. They say, why did you bring us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? You have language, they use language of the promised land to describe Egypt. That's how serious they are about wishing they could go back to Egypt is it's the land flowing with milk and honey. No, the promised land is the one that's uh, meant to be described that way, poetically, of course. But they use it to describe where they had just come from. And again, you may think I'm you know, not a good Bible student and never have noticed that before. But sometimes you read and study things and, and something that, I don't want to say basic, but you know obvious, just kind of jumps off the page for the first time. I never had really thought about it, that they're using promised land language to describe <laughs> a place where they had been enslaved um, previously before the book of Numbers, uh, back in the book of Exodus. Numbers chapter 17 and verse 2. There's going to be a couple from this first part of Numbers chapter 17 that deal with uh, some Hebrew words that can mean a couple of different things that, that don't change the meaning of the text, but shed a little bit of light on the text. Uh, this is the, the text where Aaron's staff buds you know, to show that he really is the one. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel and get from them staffs, uh, one for each father's house and all their chiefs according to their father's houses, 12 staffs, write each man's name on his staff. Now, it is true of the word staffs, plural in that verse, but it becomes more clear with the singular word staff, this, this note does anyway, that the same Hebrew word means staff, as it does here, and tribe. So it's a bit of a play on words, a bit of a play on uh, object, I guess you could say, that yes, they took a staff or a rod, and yes, they were to write or engrave their name. But the play on words basically is that they were tribing their tribe. They were they were inscribing the name of their tribe on something that could also mean tribe or, uh, excuse me, they also mean staff. Again, the text means what it says. I'm not trying to play tricks with you, but it's just an interesting little use of uh, a Hebrew word that can mean more than one thing uh, to make a just a beautiful picture there, a powerful picture of what's going on. That is also found later in this same text in verse 8, on the next day Moses went into the tent of the, of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Now again, that means exactly what it says. Okay, I'm not trying to question the text or anything else. But by specifically giving that detail, it produced blossoms. Again, it's possible as a little bit of a play on word in Hebrew, because the same Hebrew word translated as blossoms, is used in Exodus 28, 36 and Leviticus 8, 9 for the high priest's headdress. What was Aaron being proven as here? That he was the real priest. And so by specifically including that detail, yes, it had blossoms on it. There's no question about that. Uh, but the Hebrew word specifically used here was also one that described the headdress of the high priest. Uh, and so Again, we're not again we're not trying to play tricks with the text. We're just saying that some of these words mean several different things, and when you put those together, it just it adds a little bit more flavor to things. It helps us to see that all of this really was through the providence of God. Uh, and at times, like the thing with staff, maybe there's a little bit of play on words: staff and tribe, staff and clan, or you know. And uh, so again, just just interesting little notes there, little, little plays with with the Hebrew. Uh, that help us to understand the text, not question the text, but see some connections to some other things. Numbers 18, verse 19. you got a very, I don't say unique, it's found elsewhere in Scripture, but rare uh, phrase to describe something between God's people and the Lord. Uh, Numbers 18, 19 says, All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord I give to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord, for you and for your offspring with you. That phrase, covenant of salt. Now, obviously, you can look online, you can, you know, really technical commentaries and find pages of information uh, about what that specifically means, why that would be worded that way. Well, you probably don't have room in the margin of your Bible to write pages of material. So here's what I have. It's indestructible. Salt to preservative. Um, that's probably, at, at its extremely most basic level, why that 
uh, picture or that object is used to describe this covenant. Uh, salt is a preservative, and so it's a saying this is an indestructible or a preservatable, if that's a word, uh, covenant between the people and God. Um, is there more to it than that? Undoubtedly there is. Uh, but at its most basic level, it seems to me that would make a lot of sense and a, just a basic understanding of why that, again, fairly rare phrase uh, is found there in a few other places in, in the Old Testament as well. Numbers 18, verse 29, as you see, one very simple word there. Um, let's read verses 28 and 29. Even though they're longer verses, it actually kind of set up where this is going. Verse 28 says, so you shall also present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes, which you receive from the people of Israel. And from it you shall give the Lord's contribution to Aaron the priest. Out of all the gifts to you, you shall present every contribution due to the Lord. From each its best part is to be dedicated. Now, that's obviously a principle throughout Scripture. We give God our best. But it's interesting that the word literally means fat, not best. It literally means from each its fat part. And so the idea is, <coughs> excuse me, you give God the choicest portion. It's the same concept found back in Leviticus when uh, the priests were to give the fat or to be given the fat as their portion because it was the best. Now that same concept is found in the Hebrew here of what the people were to give to God. You give him the best, literally give him the fat portion, the choicest portion is God's. Um, now best is not a bad translation, I'm not saying that, but just by knowing it literally means fat, you have that connection to the priesthood and all those sorts of things, especially under the Old Testament law where you have uh, animal sacrifices and all of that. And that may just, add again, add a little bit of flavor to the meaning uh, to help you understand that text a little better, put some more thoughts in your mind about you know, our lives of sacrifice and all those sorts of things. Numbers 19, verse 3. Um, in fact, let's read verses um, 2 and 3. The first verse just tells us that God told Moses in there in this. This is the statute of the law that the Lord had commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without without defect. By the way, I have a note in my Bible that heifer there uh, may actually literally be a word for a young cow. Uh, that I didn't put that on a heifer cow, not a heifer pig, whatever. Um, uh, in which there is no blemish, and on which a yoke has never come. That's why a yoke, right? And you shall give it to Eleazar the priest. And it shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him. Now the question becomes... Why wasn't this given to Aaron? Why was it given to Eleazar and not Aaron, this thing that was to be taken out and slaughtered? It's likely because the high priest wouldn't be unclean uh, by slaughtering this animal. Um, and so Eleazar, and this is not not technically the way of putting it, sort of an understudy, if you will, of Aaron. Again, that's not technically correct, but it's just a simple way to picture it. Could do this job. But the high priest, uh, there were certain things he he might have might have been able to do, but it was better if another priest did it so the high priest would not be unclean at all. Uh, and so uh, this may be an example of that as to why Eleazar is told to be given this sacrifice or this animal to sacrifice instead of Aaron as the high priest being told uh, to do that. Another one from before a chapter. Uh, this is an interesting section, Numbers 20 and 21. So this note goes before chapter 20. And my note says that chapters 20 and 21 invert and it should be the pattern, not he pattern, <laughs> of the first two travel sections going from tragedy to triumph instead of vice versa. Early in Numbers, you have a couple of sections where the people travel, 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 and then something bad happens. Most famously, when they come to the shores of the Promised Land, or I should say infamously, when they travel to the shores of the Promised Land, and then the spies come back with that terrible report, and people are fearful, and so on and so forth. This section inverts it. It begins with the death of Miriam, it begins with uh, the waters at Meribah being bitter. It begins with Moses uh, uh, striking the rock and all of that. And then goes to the people being successful in their travel. Now, is that any big deal? Maybe not. But it's interesting the first two times in the book you have you know, travel, 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 and then something bad happened. This section just before they travel, you have the tragedy hit at the, at the outset of it. And so you have a bit of an inversion there. Again, I say of the pattern, not he pattern, uh, of of the uh, the way the book typically works, or the the way this book has worked, uh, leading up to this section in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter twenty and verse two, uh, you have the problem of there being no water. Uh, now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Uh, obviously, that's exactly what it means. But it's interesting that some scholars tell us that area 
has three oases. And so not only was this an unusual situation, it was an urgent situation. They probably thought there would be water there, but there wasn't. Um, and so obviously it's dangerous, uh, but it's also, it was also unusual. Uh, of course, you can, you can guess. It's led to some speculation. Hey, God caused me no water. We don't know that. All it says is there was no water. Uh, and so, uh, again, obviously it means what it says, but just the fact that there wasn't any in that particular location uh, would have been uh, unusual uh, in, uh, in addition to, sorry, uh, being obviously urgent. You kind of need water for yourself, your animals, and so on and so forth. Numbers 20, verse 12. This is after... Uh, Moses strikes the rock. Uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Um, when God said to uphold me, uphold God, as holy, why, why didn't he uphold them as holy? Why, why didn't he do that? Well, he didn't do what he said. There's a point of application there that obeying God shows his holiness to the world, or you might just simply say to others. If I'm not obeying God, why would anybody think I think he's holy? When Moses was told to, to do what he was supposed to do the rock, and he didn't do it, <coughs> excuse me, God said, that's not upholding me as holy. Uh, but when we do what God says, we show God's holiness to the world. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 3. You have uh, a king in, uh, in Canaan named Arad or Arad, uh, and the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites and devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. That word destruction is what I have a note beside. And it ties to something later. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 3 will state that this particular account was in part to help avoid apostasy. Why did God let them you know, kill all these people, win all these battles and these sorts of things? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But one of them was... So they would avoid apostasies. They wouldn't fall into the sins that these people were just absolutely filled with uh, throughout their throughout their lands, throughout their people groups in that area. And so that's why you have the word destruction, is, is to avoid uh, the apostasy, the idolatry, anything else that might be going on there. Uh, any temptation would have been taken out of the way. Numbers 21 and verse 6, you have this account of the bronze serpent <laughs> and God sending fiery serpents. This is a wonderful text for Vacation Bible School, but we may not be getting it right. We sometimes picture, you know, serpents or snakes that are on fire or something like that, and that's what it means. I thought that for a long time, too. It's a neat picture. It's probably not what it means. Probably that word fiery to describe the serpents or the snakes is likely because the bite or the sore was painful, you know, fiery, or because the mark it left was red. It was fire-colored. I think it's probably the former of those two. Uh, the serpent bit, and the, the place became like fire. Um, it became very sore. You've probably felt that way at some point, to some degree. Uh, I have a, a allergy to things like hornets and things like that, and I was bit or stung not all that long ago, uh, late last summer, by, by uh, yellow jackets. That was fiery. <laughs> that hurt. And that's probably what this means. It probably does not mean the serpents were on fire. It probably means the effect of what they did was fiery. Uh, it hurt the people in, in that way. Numbers 21 and verse 24. You have God's people defeating some people, Sihon and others. Uh, 24 specifically says Israel defeated him, Sihon, with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land uh, from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far as to the Ammonites. For the border of the Ammonites was strong. Now, the specific reason given that verse as to why they went that far is because the Ammonites had a strong border. But there's probably something else as well, and probably, or at least a reason why, the Ammonites had a strong border. Deuteronomy again, Deuteronomy 2.19 says, the Ammonites were descended from Lot. And so it's possible that this remote relationship, this remote relation, kept Israel from fully attacking. Uh, these are, while distant relatives, they're still relatives. Uh, and so... You have a connection there way back to, to Abram and Lot. Now Abram's descendants and Lot's descendants are you know bordering with one another, but they'll attack. The Ammonites have a strong border, yes, but it's also a uh, connection to uh, their history, their family history, as to why maybe they don't fully attack or why they you know why they don't deal with them in, in that way. So all these notes have helped you as we've gone through Numbers chapter 21. We've got a couple more videos in the book of Numbers that will be released over the next few weeks, Lord willing. 
We release these every other Thursday. That's typically our plan. We hope we continue sticking with that plan. We hope all these videos encourage you to study these sections of God's Word. Sometimes we overlook or we just remember the parts we remember and don't really dig down into them anymore. All these videos are not meant to be deep Bible studies, uh, but hopefully give you some things to think about. Maybe illuminate some things from the text that encourage you to study these sections of Scripture. I know they do me when, I, when I'm studying them as well, and hopefully they do for you. We hope that all these videos, make sure you, by the way, subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. We release these on both of those. It would help us if you <laughs> subscribe to both, and we appreciate that very much. And let us know about what we're trying to do through these videos, and hopefully they encourage you. And as always, we hope these help you to read the Bible, study the Bible, and live the Bible. Thanks for watching.